Hello, this is Danny and this is my video on competitive markets and perfect competition. It's quite simple I think in terms of graphical content, not quite as challenging as some of the other sections that we're going to have later, but here we go. There's lots of different types of market structure we're going to look at in various sections. The one we're going to look at now is perfect competition, which is when there's a large number of small firms. And we'll come on to more detail about assumptions you make for perfect competition in a minute. Other different structures you could have would be oligopoly, where there's a few large firms which dominate the industry. Big ones for that are gas. I think there's six large firms and supermarkets. You could argue that there are about four large firms. And finally, monopoly, which is when one firm compromises the entire industry. So I know that for the postal service, the Royal Mail was definitely a big one there. I'm trying to think of other monopolies that we have. All I can think of is the board game. Now let's look at the assumptions we have for perfect competition. I've got a pretty rainbow here of all the different assumptions we make. It always surprises me how many colours there are in the rainbow. So first we have a large number of buyers and sellers, which means that all product that's produced is sold, and the firm is also a price taker. It has to accept price ruling in a market. This is different to a monopoly, which will be a price maker, since it's the only producer of a good or service. It can effectively decide which price it wants to sell it at. Next, no firm or buyer is large enough to affect the price. So we, can't, we don't have any monopsony or monopoly situations. Next, perfect market exists, which means that buyers and sellers have got perfect knowledge of products and prices. All products are homogenous, which means that products are all the same regardless of who makes them. So if you make a banana and I make a banana, they're going to be the same, which is very unrealistic. Some of the assumptions are definitely unrealistic. Also, freedom of market entrance and exit, which means there's no barriers to entry or exit, so meaning that all firms can effectively come and make normal profits, more on that later. That's unrealistic, because there's always going to be barriers to entry, and I believe we'll look at some of them in more detail later. Readily, in different video even, readily available information, which means that everyone can benefit from technological advances, which sounds great, because if one person's got this great new design, we can all benefit, we can all be more efficient problem is, if they know that we can all benefit, they're not going to invest money into getting this new design, which means that nobody can benefit. So firms are unlikely to engage in research and development when there is readily available information. And finally, factors of production are perfectly mobile, so anyone can do anything anywhere. Again, very unrealistic, because Johnny might be an accountant now. Obviously, he can't suddenly go and become a teacher. He might need some teacher training. So whilst factors of production, we assume they're perfectly mobile, so that... If anyone's making super normal profits, they'll easily be eaten away. More on that later again. This is totally unrealistic, a totally unrealistic assumption. When we have perfect competition, we assume that demand is perfectly elastic, which means that the individual firm has to accept the equilibrium X, which is that red line there. Obviously, if it produces above this, it's not going to have any customers, and if it produces below this, it's not going to make the maximum profit it could make. The consumer and producer surpluses are both maximised, since it is producing literally there, and the price is on the cross. And we have allocative efficiency, there's the optimum allocation of scarce resources. Everything that is produced is sold, so we're only producing what the consumers want, and that's because we've got such a large number of buyers and sellers. A definition of allocative efficiency is when the marginal cost of the last units produced is equal to the price of the last unit. We're going to see a diagrammatic representation of that later. But that's what essentially occurs in a perfect competition situation. That diagram is quite small there, so I hope you can read it. But essentially, a firm wishing to maximise its profit or minimise its losses, if it's doing badly, will always produce where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, which you can see on that diagram there. The firm's producing at Y, which is where this occurs. So let's look at short-run profits. Short-run, total revenue is equal to the price of units times the number of units sold, which is XY. The total cost of production is equal to average total cost times output, so the number of units sold again, which is ZY. Total profit is obviously total revenue minus total cost, which is XY minus ZY, which is equal to K. Since K is positive, it is supernormal profit. In a perfect market, lots of other firms are going to enter the market until all supernormal profits are eaten away. We're going to see this on the next slide, I believe. They can always enter because there are no barriers to entry. We assume that any firms can enter or exit a market at any one time. Let's see a diagrammatic representation of this. Firms that are attracted to the super normal profits enter the industry. So we're originally there at S1 and obviously the price at which we're selling, pound X, is greater than the sort of average total cost. People are making money. People are making lots of super normal profits. So we're going to see firms deciding to come and to try to get these supernormal profits by entering the industry. And very quickly, supply will increase from S1 to S2. And we know that when supply increases, the price decreases. 
This means that at the same time as the price falling, the firm's revenue curve will also shift downward as the price will be falling. Obviously, you're going to make less revenue if the price falls, so both price and revenue will fall together. To maximise profits, firms will be forced to produce at W, which is there, so it's going to be less than it was producing when it was making super normal profits. It's going to just make W, and it can't produce more than this because any unit produced above this will add more to costs than to revenue. A firm will always produce when marginal revenue equals marginal cost if it wants to maximise profits. Incidentally, this is the optimum output. It's also productively efficient. So now let's look at prices and revenues and costs. Total revenue is price times units, which is ZW. Total cost is average total cost times output, which is ZW again. Total profit is ZW minus ZW, which is equal to K. K is equal to zero. The long-term position for a firm in a perfect market is always going to be at K, which is where zero pounds of profit, or zero pounds of super normal profit, should I say, are made. Normal profit is always going to be equal to average total cost, which equals average revenue here. It's important to remember that normal profit contains everything that's needed to keep the factors of production in their current job doing the same thing, so it covers all the opportunity costs of doing something else, so a firm will be perfectly happy to make normal profit. And certainly from the consumer's point of view, this is an ideal situation. We don't want firms to be making more money from us than they have to take from us, unless, of course, they're going to use it for investment. Obviously, the problem here we've got, because they're not getting super normal profit, they're a bit less likely to invest money, so because they've got less money to invest, which means that we're not going to have as efficiency stuff, as efficient, I don't know why I said efficiency stuff, it's not going to be as efficient, which means prices could potentially be higher and quality could potentially be lower. It's evaluative points that you could make. Here are some types of efficiency, and I really wish that I had made dynamically efficient purple, because then it would be the tilt of these. So we have PO, which is productively efficient, which is when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The optimum output if you want to maximise profit, I'm pretty sure I said that like 10 times in the last video. Allocatively efficient, we've got la la here, which is when marginal cost of the last unit is equal to the price of the last unit. So what is being produced is what the consumers want. Productively efficient is when we're producing as much as we can at the lowest possible cost. Allocatively is when we're producing what the consumers want. Dipsy, statically efficient, is when we're doing both at the same time. Tinky winky there, dynamically efficient, is when we have efficiency over time. So we've got new products, new techniques. This will lead to more economic growth. We'll see our production possibility boundary shifting outwards. We've got more and more potential. However, this is unlikely with perfect competition because, as we said in the last page, because all information is readily available to all firms, there's no incentive for firms to invest into research and development because if any extra profit they can make will immediately be caught up with by other firms. So prices come straight back down again and profits will fall. Ba -dum -ba -dum. It's important here to note that firms aren't going to be large enough to exploit economies of scale, so prices could potentially be higher than they would otherwise be in an oligopoly or monopoly situation, although obviously prices tend to be assumed to be a lot higher under monopolies since they can afford to charge higher prices. Also, we assume that firms in perfect competition will have an efficient allocation of resources, so that's good in terms of they are definitely being allocatively efficient, they're producing what we want, what the consumer wants, although they might not be producing it at the lowest price necessarily through good means. They might be you know, producing more pollution than is necessary because they need to keep costs low so they're going to create negative externalities, whereas in a larger firm, so for example a monopoly, they might have the objective of trying to have a low carbon footprint or have less environmental impact, have social welfare at the heart of their being, whereas this is very unlikely to occur for a firm in a competitive market since it can't afford to do this. Things get slightly less fun here when we consider the situation in which firms make losses, which is always sad for the firm involved. So let's assume that the market is operating at S1 there, uh, which means that total revenue is price times units, which is ZW, total cost is average total cost times output, which is QW, and total profit is ZW times QW, which is negative. Dun, 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 dun. That's the Pink Panther theme tune, not sure why that came into play there. Well, I don't know, you, could probably, you can even tell, I'm tone deaf. Uh, anyway, so, if firms are making a loss, they are obviously going to leave the market. Not so great, which means the supply will shift leftwards, and that will put the price back up again, at which point firms will be able to make normal profit once more. A lot of people think that it's obvious that as soon as you start making a loss, you're going to leave unless there's some forecast you're going to grow back up again very strongly, because if obviously making a loss is not an attractive situation. However, there's a few things that firms consider when considering when about to leave. Say you've paid for a year's worth of a factory, you've 
you rented the factory out for a whole year and then your firm collapses in January do you really want to be paying fixed costs for a whole year paying for that factory for a whole year with absolutely nothing to offset that I'd say definitely not because if a firm shuts down immediately all fixed costs have to be paid out of the owner's pocket if we have a situation as in the situation we have just here where the average variable cost is less than the price it makes sense to keep producing for a bit in order to offset your fixed costs because if you're getting more from continuing to produce than your variable costs it makes sense even if it doesn't reach your fixed costs to keep producing for a bit let's say we have Daniel and for Daniel the fixed cost of producing each pen is 10p the variable cost is 10p and he sells them each for 15p because there was a bit of a downward trend in the market and he had to reduce his price if he stops selling immediately, he's going to have to keep paying his fixed costs for a bit, whilst not making any extra money to offset this. Whereas if he keeps producing for a bit, whilst he will have to pay his fixed costs and he will be making a loss of 5p per pen, because he's making an extra 5p per pen above a variable cost, because variable costs were 10p, price was 15p, that's 5p he can put towards offsetting the fixed costs. Obviously he'll only do this in the short term until fixed costs have run out, essentially, so he doesn't have to keep paying them anymore. If at any point the situation occurs where the price goes below Z, the firm will leave the industry immediately because it can't cover its variable costs, so there's no point in continuing to produce. So if, I think his name was Daniel, was selling pens and the price then fell to 5p per pen, there's no point in him paying 10p to produce pens that only sell for 5p, if you know what I mean. Whereas if they're 15p, there is point in the short term to keep producing. Some firms might actually enter the market when the variable costs are um, greater than the price because it thinks that there's going to be future price rises very soon and it wants to enter the market and establish itself as a firm before the price rises and before the market grows strong. Obviously this is a very risky strategy to take. Here we have a slide on the structural performance and conduct model and the model basically states that individual performance depends ultimately on the industry structure. And we've got these variables here and don't ask why there's a banana on the slide. It looked a bit empty and I didn't know what to do. These are definitely really important things to get to grips with because you could have a question asking you how the structure impacts something. Obviously, if you write all about the conduct, then that's not a great thing to do. Like me in my LR2 exam last year, it asked me to write about future woodlands and I wrote about woodlands. What a disaster. Structure is basically the number and size of buyers and sellers, the degree of product differentiation, so what are you producing, what am I producing, we're producing the same thing, different things, and how many barriers are there to entry and potentially exit, so could I come and enter a new industry if I chose to do so. Conduct is basically the activities of buyers and sellers, so buyers is definitely their position of power, have we got a monopsony playing a role here, and sellers, do they use their productive capacity, what are their pricing policies, are they investing in research and development, that sort of thing. And performance is all to do with welfare maximisation, so are resources achieving their highest potential output value for the economy so could we potentially be making more are we not necessarily reaching our maximum capacity in terms of what we could be producing in order to increase welfare obviously that's always the ultimate aim of any economy to maximize welfare within the economy although different economies will put some people's welfare ahead of others and that sort of thing since we do tend to have optimal allocation of resources within this competitive market, governments might actually try to introduce competition policies in order to try to get as close to the perfect sort of market situation as possible. There was actually an exam question in Econ 3 a few years ago, I think, I'm not quite sure when, it might be last year, to do with how close we could potentially get to a perfect market situation given technological advances like the internet. That was definitely a very interesting, quite fun question to write an answer to. If this question did come up again, I think what you'd want to be looking at most was what we had on the second slide, I think, where we had all the list of assumptions that we make. How close can we get to these sort of assumptions? How close can we get to having no barriers to entry and exit and that sort of thing? Woo! That's the end of the video on competitive markets, I believe. Join me next time for a video on the theory of monopoly. Sounds like a lot of fun there. Right, have a lovely day. See you soon. Goodbye.